I'm going to introduce now Christine Hoopers. It's my, my colleague from CERT.br. And I will go for the short uh, name of the presentation because it's too big. <laughs> so we're going to talk about challenges on um, remediation and, and compromise the device. And so, Christine? This was a presentation I gave originally, originally at uh, another forum of CERTs, that's the National Sea CERTs Forum. And it is specifically to talk a little bit about, everybody says about Internet of Things. So uh, in Brazil, people say, if you don't talk about Internet of Things in a presentation, it's not a presentation. But anyway, one of the things we need to think is what exactly is a thing. So if you go for the poorest, they will say that is the very small, low, uh, energy devices, Bluetooth, sensors everywhere. But the thing is that we are realizing that what people are doing now is getting very powerful devices and treating them as just things. They are just abandoned on the internet. They are not computers, they are not cell phones, and they are not tablets. So there are a little bit of the section, uh, second definition here that is anything that's beyond desktops, and uh, mobile devices. And in our experience, uh, these are some quotes we are hearing in our daily activities, reporting incidents. When we report, oh, you have this, oh, this is just a, put whatever you want in there. This is just a hard drive, this is just a home router, this is just a switch, this is just whatever. So we even, I'm gonna talk about an incident that we call them, no, we don't have internet here. And then okay, but you know, you have internet there, so it's this kind of thing. And the worst one is when they say, oh yeah, that device is connected, but it's not my responsibility. So we have like some devices connected, no one is actually doing anything with them. They are just there. So starting with hard drive, so this is old news, this is the Synology, network appliance. It's a hard drive on the cloud, so whatever you can call it. So, but we have Bitcoin miners compromising that. This log specifically is from 2014, but we see this daily still today. So we still have this botnet, is active, is compromising um, hard drives. From people that are following the news, I think the latest one was Seagate that had a telnet not, was a not documented telnet backdoor. So they call it management access. So it's really a backdoor. So it's just a matter of time for people to use that. And then we have, I think, the worst category of uh, things that are the CPEs, the consumer premises uh, equipments, that are basically broadband routers, Wi-Fi routers, and anything that people put at home. And most of the consumers, they treat that as they treat their VCR, as they treat their fridge. So it's a box that either my ISP put it there or I bought it. It's completely forgotten on the network. And this is just one of the examples that we are still seeing in our honeypots that is really the IDRA botnet. This is not the IDRA, this is another one that is really a DDoS botnet. So these devices are just being forgotten. From our experience, ISP say, oh no, this is now at the home, is at the home of the person. They should be responsible. See, if you go to the consumer, they say, oh no, this is the ISP box. I have nothing to do with it. And we, are, we have an increase of incidents dealing with this kind of devices in Brazil. And from some statistics that I'm gonna show, uh, this is a huge problem in the whole Latin America too. So I wanted to bring this uh, for this presentation, especially because of this. So these are some specific incidents we are dealing that are being a challenge. The first one is we had a CCTV system, was actually the main controller of uh, security cameras that was compromised and was hosting a phishing. So actually this we only learned after two, three weeks talking to the people what actually it was. Because what, uh, everything that we got was a phishing from an international brand, was not a phishing for Brazil, was came from another brand, was hosting in an IP. And the ISP, the, the network provided upstream, did the right thing. It was in the the whole system, it was delegated to the right person, it was a slash 28 block, so we contacted everyone, no response. 
the ISP got not response, we go no, got no response. So after a while, our instant handlers got um, a hold of a phone number. And then we got someone telling, King of Construction would apply, good morning. And we are, okay, uh, do you have internet there? No, we don't have internet here. This is just a warehouse. We just store like, you know, tiles and other stuff. There is no internet here. And we call back the ISP, no, this slash 28 is, is delegated to them, is theirs. So, okay, we had to go forward, but there was this no internet here, and they said, okay, maybe the owner knows something. So days later, we actually got in contact with the owner, and he, he just said, oh yeah, we really don't have any internet here. We just have security cameras that we can watch in real time. And then I said, huh, so if you can watch them in real time, probably it is connected to the internet. So what he said, I'll give you the number of the consultant, but he's away. And he was in places in the countryside that there were no cell phones, no telephones, nothing. So some days later, and the phishing is still online. So that was like weeks of work. So then we finally got to the consultant. He said, oh, I have no idea how to get that phishing offline. So I don't know how to change it, and I don't know how it got there. And he just decided that the solution would be change ISPs. So then he called back and said, oh, I changed my ISP. Can you check if the phishing is still online? And I was, yeah, and that IP is not online anymore. So, and this was a very bad like case for us because then at the end, we, we still don't know exactly which model of CCTV is this, but we know that mostly what people have is like one or two model of security camera recorders in the central area that people just change the box and sell them again and again and again. So we don't know exactly which one it is. So we don't know how many other vendors use the same CCTV, and probably there are tons of CCTV hacks out, hacked out there this one, it happened to host a phishing website, but probably the other ones, you just have the burglars watching their security feeds and doing whatever they want. So this was a case that was like three weeks to try to get the phishing offline. It was a lot of man hours, a lot of people in the phone, and at the end, you don't really have like a clear um, solution for it. It was just like, we never got any better feedback, so it's just a best effort. The other major problem we are having here is the use of CPEs and rogue DNS servers. So just the first thing I always say, and you'll see something written here, this is no DNS changer, this is completely different. So when we talk about CPEs and DNS, people, oh, this is DNS changer. No, it's not DNS changer. So um, it's basically compromised websites, iframes injected in them with malicious JavaScript code, that actually just use the browser to do uh, cross-site request forgery attacks and compromise the CPE using weak passwords, using uh, telnet brute force, and then at the end they change the DNS configuration to point to a different site. So one of the challenges, the user PC is never compromised. So uh, when they have any problem with banks or something, you go, the PC is just clean. There is nothing in there. It's just the CPE that is changed in there. So this will say, this is not the NS changer. This is different. It's big. We know that's also happening in Poland a lot. And we have indications that a lot of uh, home routers being used in Latin America are the same models that we have in Brazil. So I think it's just a matter of time before we have this attack spreading to other places. So basically, what they do, they first configure a rogue DNS server. What we are seeing now is just hosting companies. They are just going straight for all hosting companies. They just buy a hosting server, get a DNS server up, and start uh, providing authoritative answers. So they do not compromise anything. They don't have a web page. There's nothing in there. It's just a virtual machine with a malicious DNS server. That's it. And there is no cache poisoning. A lot of people say, oh, this is cache poisoning. No, no, no cache poisoning at all. It's just a web server. It's not open recursive. It's just a web server in there. And this case specifically was online. And you can see that the website, the fake phishing page, was hosted in the same hosting company. That was just a coincidence. Like the DNS was in here, and other IP from the same hosting company was the other DNS. So if you go there, this was specifically for doing payments online. 
uh, in Brazil. So the phishing web page, you can see that actually is going there. But the CPE only get only points to the rogue DNS after they do CSRF um, attacks on the CPE. So what you see is like we have usually like 5,000 attempts with uh, common passwords, ISPs, common passwords, and other default passwords for um, CPEs. They just change the DNS, reboot after that, just to make sure that's persistent, and then they move on. And and then finally, actually, they change the CPE configuration and they finally are able to change. What we are seeing now is that not only bank domains, they are providing false responses for things like Google Analytics. So any website that uses Google Analytics, if you visit the website, it will try to download malware or something. If you go to a bank web page, it will be a phishing. If they go to eBay or PayPal, then it will be a page for that. And they are also providing wrong answers for all the social networking and all the email servers. So it's, it's really widespread, it's really big, so it's one of the points there. One special case is the Ahes Broadband Router. So I even put here the banner because uh, you know those bad decisions of design that we are not able to change? So the Ahis comes with Telnet, Telnet by default. Uh, you cannot disable Telnet and you cannot change the password. So the only way to get rid of Telnet, and they decided instead of having a default password, oh, this will be bad, so let's have this fancy algorithm to have a password of the day. So you go to the internet, you have several websites that already figure out how to create the password of the day. So if you go to show done, you can have a list, you, can, you, you only need to query for enter password. So here, I don't know if this is behind the poll here, but you can see that um, the countries that have the most number, it's Brazil, today is with 150,000. We already had days that was like 200,000, depending on the CPE if it's on or off. Uh, then it's Mexico with 73,000, then Chile, US, and Poland. So, and Ahis is what used to be in the past the Motorola broadband. So they were bought by another company, changed the name. So this is really bad. So it's something that the only way to get rid of this is actually to activate a firewall in the CPE and change the password. Because if you go to the admin interface and change the password, it's not changing. It changed all the passwords, but Telnet password. So uh, these cases have become more complex because to get rid of the attack, you need to tackle the DNS, the phishing page, the page that's hosting the iframe with the cross-site request forgery attack, and you need to find the victims to try to clean the CPEs. So it's, it's really complicated to deal with this. And this is just some idea of how, how many rogue DNS servers we have daily. Actually, the number this date is from June. Now we are steady on 50 per day, and they are all in hosting providers. We don't have any compromised DNS. It's just all hosting providers all over. Uh, in, the green one is in Brazil. We actually managed to explain to our hosting companies. They changed all their processes. They changed the training of the first level people. And today, if they try to put in Brazil, it's minutes online and then it's offline. But then now, uh, the major ones are really Netherlands, US, uh, Russia and some other countries, and France and Canada. So you can imagine which hosting provider is that. So, and then we have some alternates. So for for us that have uh, in Brazil specifically, we have a lot of cases where we have um, small ISPs in the countryside that they don't have. They they, they provide radio connectivity, and they buy a very cheap uh, router that's Mikrotik that's made in Latvia. And it comes with default login admin password blank. So this is spread all over. And you can manage them uh, remotely via Telnet, SSH, and web management. So most of these routers are out there with no password. And what the people doing fraud are doing now, they just log in there and they provide the rogue DNS via DHCP. So in these routers, you don't need to compromise the CPE. You just go straight for the machine that is providing DNS via DHCP and that is being provided to the users from scratch. So there's no compromise but the router of the ISP. So this is a little bit tricky. We are providing training and giving speeches and all the ISP associations, organizations try to 
explain to them that they need to have better, pass, be, better password management. And this router, usually they are like a small box with an antenna, and they are hanging in a pole in the middle of nowhere, providing internet. So it's not really the kind of device that's easy access for everyone. So another thing is that we are seeing in Brazil and everywhere CP is being abused for DDoS attacks. So we still have botnets that do DDoS, but today is even better to just use default services that do amplification attacks. So in our statistics for 2014, our DDoS uh, data was 217 times bigger than 2013. That's not percent, it's times. And this graph here is logarithm. We could not actually represent it otherwise. So we went from, from 1,000 reports of DDoS to 200,000 reports of DDoS. But they were not uh, Brazilian companies being DDoS. They were basically devices in Brazil being abused to perpetrate DDoS. And if you look at the protocols, and when we go to the ASNs, these IPs belong, it is all broadband CPEs being abused, SNMP, SSTP, DNS, and NTP. So it's really bad what is there. So this is another point that we are seeing a lot. So just summing up, what are the challenges that we are seeing and that we see that for the community is, first of all, we are having a really hard time to explain to the hosting companies all the DNS attacks. So all the hosting companies that we manage to reduce is after really a while because their default answer is I just, oh, I forward your complaint to the client. And then we try to explain, okay, the client, it's the criminal. You cannot just forward to the client. It's never going to come offline. So because they're actually buying it. And the thing is, oh, but our analysts, they go to the web browser and there's nothing there. And then we try to explain that that's not a phishing page, that you need to be looking at some, something else. So really, most of the first level abuse teams of the hosting companies, they don't know what to do. They don't understand the report. The logs are there. So usually, we need to go via other channels, find someone from the technical background in the hosting companies to explain to them, and then they need to change training for the hosting companies. So this is very, very complicated. And most of the automatic systems, they don't uh, um, identify this kind of complaints because they are expecting phishing, malware, and some other kind of abuses. They are not expecting a DNS server up and an abusing there. So this is a, a challenge. And uh, when the like when the MOG hosting document came out, we were happy, oh, this is the best practice, but it doesn't cover this. So because it's it's really not that kind of common attack. For us, it's like the biggest one, but it's not really common for other organizations. Another challenge is that we have too many vulnerable websites. Uh, I think uh, the last presentation talked really about all those WordPress and Joomla and old versions, and they're pretty easily abused to ins insert iframes with JavaScript. Uh, too many vulnerable things out there, mainly today CPEs, but this year was the year of cars compromised, of whatever compromised. So, because people think, oh, this is really, this is really just a Unix machine running out there. So it's really bad. So this is another challenge. Um, and in our case, it's also difficult to locate and educate our small ISPs because usually they are entrepreneurships that they got the idea, they are putting internet to places where the big companies are not, but they are not really that deep technical savvy people. They have consultants that go there. So it's, it's really hard to try to teach all the consultants on how to change configurations, why default passwords are bad, and stuff like that. And I think detecting these incidents is very difficult. Because uh, we saw today people talking about indicators compromise and this and that, but like all the CPEs that are just with a bad DNS server in that, it's very hard to see what they're querying. Even if you use passive DNS, we were doing some work with some people trying to use that, but it's, it's hard. So all the vendors are doing all the mistakes from the past, and we know that the pressure on the CPE vendors is to have the cheapest thing, not the more secure thing. But if you have like a device that don't allow you to disable a service, like the AHES one, then it's even worse. Because even if you get like a, something that the default is bad, how do you make that default better if you cannot get rid of, of 
those configurations. And we need to remember that IPv6 is getting traction. At least in Brazil, we got like a boom of IPv6 in households and mobile devices now. And we are going to have more things surfacing out there. So you could have that or more smart things. You can have like uh, um, all those weather stations connected to the internet. Anyone done a study on how secure they are? Probably no study on there. You will have more and more uh, recording mechanisms for TV. We are going to have more and more hard disks just open to the internet. And then there's a question for all of you to go back. Are your systems ready to deal with IPv6 abuse? So uh, we, three years ago, got some scripts broken for that. So make sure that you can deal with IPv6 IP the addresses. But one of the things that I would like to now kind of make a pitch is that we discuss too much about blocking. So we need blacklists and we need blocking and we need threat intelligence to create blacklists. We really need us to get the, the situation better. So uh, we at CertBR are trying to use all the data feeds and information just to do remediation and not to do blocking. Because we can get to a point that we block the whole internet. So I think the first one is really encourage the adoption of best practices. The best practices are out there, but we need to more actively encourage people to adopt them. So ISPs, BCP38 is one. We can go to port 25 management or other stuff, but DDoS is so bad and they're abusing all the CPs just because no one implemented anti-spoofing. Actually, there's a statistic that 60% implements of the internet, but then if you have 40% allowing amplification attacks and allowing uh, spoofing attacks, that's bad. And ISPs need better policies for their broadband devices. This needs to be done. Better password policies, uh, management policies, because these devices are just forgotten there. Nobody updates firmware, nobody does anything. So either they pass the torch and tell to the users that they need to do it. Some ISPs even don't allow users to change passwords. So we need to change a little bit this industry out there. Uh, hosting providers, I think they need to establish policies involving cases that are different from a web page up there. Because people with the cloud going on, it's not only, you don't have only more phishing. They, they are just putting services up. And the first level abuse teams, they don't know how to read those complaints. So there needs to be any loop or or a feedback loop that we can try to say, okay, this is a new kind of attack. Your old script for your abuse team doesn't work anymore. And we are working with some hosting companies in Brazil to more proactively detect rogue DNS servers being hosting, hosted in their uh, organizations, either via passive DNS or scanning their hosting machines and changing their policies to allow them to do that. So that's also important. And I think anyone, everyone needs to pay more attention to instant notifications because most of the bad cases, they were not fined. We have more and more people uh, with those bad cases of data breaches saying that, yeah, I only knew because someone told me. So there are a lot of people, including all the certs here in this room, that are telling people about the bad problems. We just need people to triage this better and to listen to it. Act on data feeds. You can call it IOCs, threat intelligence, whatever, but it's just data feed. So go to Shadow Server, Team Camry, Dragon Research. LACNIC is receiving some of these feeds and sharing with people from, that are members of LACNIC, LACNIC Warp. So we have feeds, and maybe start using NetFlows and IPFix. We had a presentation two weeks ago in our annual c -Search forum. That was just awesome. As a university, that was showing incidents that they haven't detected by any other means, only via flows. So you need to think about net flows and about that. We need to educate users. I know that Foy is going to talk a little bit more about that. But we need to educate. We have extensive material in Brazil. We have a campaign running for 15 years. ISOC is, fu is funding uh, the translation to Spanish. So if you go to Cartilla CertBR, there's the Spanish version. If you go to Cartilla CertBR, there's the Portuguese version. In Spanish, for now, we have six booklets. One for social networks, passwords, privacy, e-commerce, mobile devices, and internet banking. But in the, this year, we wrote one about two-factor authentication and one about home networks that's really talking about you need to change the password of your DSL router. You need to do something better with your Wi-Fi. So this is coming soon. This is all Creative Commons. This has slides. 
to teach. So you can deliver training, teaching, schools. We have a lot of people using that. So the Spanish version is here. We are probably next year start sharing that with some people people in Africa, because Osimara was there last week with his countries that speak Portuguese uh, in Africa, and they already proposed that they want to use the material. It's kind of funny, but they need to do a translation too. Although they speak Portuguese, it doesn't translate. It's not the same. So they are going to do some translation as well. And try to use metrics. So use any metrics you want. There's one metric that is not really um, well known yet, it's the CyberGreen. So if you go to cybergreen.net, it's uh, for now they are using public sources. Uh, for now registering the website is free, so you can just go there, you can have access to everything. And it's really we need to improve the security and we need to mitigate and remediate instead of just blocking. So this is the green index for this week. So how the world is on vulnerable and infected um, areas. And if you go to a specific country, then you can have like the best improvers. So the top improvers for our region uh, were some countries here. So Venezuela, Chile, Brazil, Bolivia, Uruguay, Suriname, Colombia, and Argentina. And you can create logins in there. And basically here, the metrics are up. Uh, they re unite metrics from all the data feeds I mentioned a few slides back. So they have Shadow Server Data, uh, Dragon Research Group, Team Camry, some other ones. So uh, a lot of data about vulnerable websites, like all the da those data about open resolvers, about uh, NTP amplification. And you can try to look and use this data you know, to try to see if policies are actually making an improvement or not, and try to get metrics to get changes in, in policies and improvement. So this was my presentation. I think I finished on time. So I don't know if there's like some time for questions. Yes, uh, has anyone? Hi. So yeah, uh, again, for me, it seems that uh, one of the main difficulties is still the, the communication with the, the ISPs and sometimes to explain them so that they, they understand how things work. And so, so it's just an idea that came to my mind. Okay, because um, going to some events uh, that are from a hosting providers and ISPs, uh, I know that they, they, for example, they have a, um, a law a law enforcement consult consultant. For example, in whenever they have a notification or something that they don't know if they should exchange data or not they can go to them and, and ask them, hey, how do I deal with that? So maybe, do you think it would be something doable to maybe try and create, have some uh, kind of consultancy for them so that they understand better when they have a problem like that, when they, they don't know what to do, maybe encourage the, the organizations, like for example, in Brazil we have Abranet and Abrint, that are associations, organizations that gather lots of uh, ISPs and, and hosting providers and so. So maybe we could try and influence them to have some one from technical background to help the ISPs to deal with these problems as well because it's sometimes it's not that they don't want to it's just they have no idea of how to yeah. the, the, the worst problem now is that they don't know that they don't know these yeah, attacks yeah. so it's the no don't know that I don't know so uh, for example in the, at the first conference this year we sit with one of the one of the major ones as this is being web streamed I'm not gonna name names uh, the, his first reaction is that you were sending notifications wrong and said, no, we are sending them right. Oh, you're not sending logs, said, no, we are sending logs. And then after like 10 minutes of back and forth, he actually logged in his system, found an email from that day that was being sent by my team. Oh, you were doing everything right. We are doing everything wrong. And then I said, yeah, we kind of figured that because we have logs, we have everything. And then I said, oh, the guys were thinking that this was spam and that was like DNS logs, you know? So this is the problem is really that we need to have a, ch a technical channel because we know that the abuse teams are not technical. So it's this challenge on how to go and how to explain. And these are very localized attacks. But of course, they are being done not in Brazil. They're being done elsewhere because people don't know how it works. And it's harder to explain and harder to take it offline. But we had like two of the major ones that were a problem after we actually had to do this explaining. And the problem was not understanding. And then at the end, the people that were reading the emails did not have technical skills to understand what was being reported. So 
So I think it's a mix, and we know that's too big. They're going to say we have millions of things, but I think that the hosting companies need to, to have at least, or uh, provide technical context for sets, or provide context for people to explain an attack that's new or something like that. And we understand that sometimes they get loaded because, yeah, but if I provide this email, I will receive tons of reports. Yeah, because your triage is not being well done. So we know that's a challenge, but I think we need to get better on, on how to get these people to listen and to, to kind of, first of all, assume that maybe they are not getting it right because everyone just replies that, oh, probably you are reporting it wrong. It's not that it's wrong, it's different. So I think this is, this is really the challenge for us. But I think that should be some associations or some, and I think this is probably what the Lucimara question was to before, that how do we give feedback for example, for Mog, that okay, we, I am a cert, and you, it's it's not on your radar this new type of attack here, that you are not yet detecting, and that you don't have best practice yet. So it's kind of it's a challenge, but I think it needs to go. Maybe, maybe it could be something that we could talk to Jesse to bring yeah. to Mog is maybe something to discuss that. See you. Sorry. Yeah, maybe this is something that maybe we can chat uh, afterwards, but this could be a good topic to be discussed at MOG and see on, on the side of the ISPs and hosting providers how do do how would there are challenges and how we can work on that, yeah. you know. Because we know that there are one or two that are just bulletproof. So some of them that host it, they are plain simple bulletproof. And we reported to some countries and they said, okay, this is going to the police channels. We're not going to do anything. But the majority are not, we hope that they're not bulletproof. They are just not, not aware. Their abuse team is just not looking at the reports. And they're just ignoring everything. Just, oh, my default is to send to my client. Yeah, that's a bad default. So maybe you, you need to look at it too, not only automatically route to your client. Because if your client is a criminal, it's going to be there indefinitely. So. Yeah, and, and then we get to another topic that's it's, it's a big discussion that's about liability, you know, who is yeah. responsible for what. But that go, that's for another, t another presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Any more questions? No? So no. let's thank you, Christine, for thank his, you. Uh, her presentation. <laughs>